So uh, today's the 17th of November, uh, 2020. Uh, this is a meeting of the Local Community Mitigation Fund, Region B. I'm calling the meeting to order. Uh, Tanya will now take attendance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, Peter Gagliardi. I am here. <laughs> Hello, Jennifer Von Figlio. Here. Michael Pease. Here. Mary McNally. Bellamy Schmidt. Here. Carmina Fernandez. Judy Theocles. Samuel Darqua. Here. Lori Tanner. Here. Allison Ebner. Here. Richard Sullivan. And Ellen Potashnik. I think I saw Ellen earlier. Yeah, I think we got a silent here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, given the unprecedented circumstances resulting from the global coronavirus pandemic, Governor Charles Baker issued an order to provide limited relief from certain provisions of the open meeting law to protect the health and safety of individuals interested in attending public meetings. In keeping with the guidance provided, the commission will conduct a public meeting utilizing remote collaboration technology. Any votes will be taken via roll call. This meeting is being recorded. And back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes from the October 13th meeting? So moved. Second. What? Sweet. All right. Back so to you, Tanya. Um, Peter Gagliardi. Um, should I be voting on this, having not been a member at that time? Um, no, you should probably abstain on that. Okay, I'll abstain. Thank okay. you. I also missed most of the meeting, so I'll abstain too. Okay. Uh, Jennifer Bonfiglio? Yes. Michael Pease? I don't know if you were there. You have to abstain. Right. You have to abstain also. Okay. Mary McNally? Bellamy Schmidt? Yes. Carmina Fernandez? Judy Theocles? Samuel Darqua? Yes. Lori Tanner abstains. Allison Ebner? Yes. Richard Sullivan? Ellen Potashnik? Yes. Okay, so that's one, two, three, four, five. Five in favor of uh, approving the minutes and three abstinences. Thank you. Um, so at this point, we can start referencing the um, file that Tanya had sent over. Um, we'll begin discussing the 2021 Community Miti Mitigation Fund Guidelines. Uh, okay, um, thanks, Sam. Yeah. Uh, so uh, actually, just before we get started on that, I'd just like to um, uh, welcome uh, Peter Galgardi and uh, Mike Peace as our new members for the Local Community Mitigation Advisory Committees. Uh, Peter is a representative from uh, Springfield and Mike is our representative from Chicopee. So we'd like to thank you for your uh, for your service to this commission and uh, and welcome you. And uh, uh, would you guys like to spend just a, a little bit and introduce yourself uh, to the to the group? Um, why don't we start with Peter? Sure, I'd uh, I'd be happy to. Uh, up until June thirtieth, I was the president and CEO of Wayfinders, a regional nonprofit housing agency that's based uh, here in Springfield. And uh, I'm now doing some work as a senior advisor to our new CEO. And uh, my current position there is part-time. And I'm also working on a history of the organization that goes back to 1973. So that's been an interesting uh, uh, path. I've been in this position for, uh, I was in the president and CEO position for 29 and a half years. So I uh, spent a lot of time uh, in Springfield and I can look out my uh, apartment window here straight into MGM. So I got my eye on them too. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, Mike? Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, I uh, work in the city of Chigabee. I'm the mayor's chief of staff here. We started uh, his administration in January. 
and kind of walked into uh, everything that's going on around us. So it's been a, quite a eventful eight months so far. Uh, before that, I worked as a uh, uh, a uh, compliance associate at uh, Voya Financial out of uh, in, out of Windsor, Connecticut. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, and just again, just before we get into the the guidelines, I just wanted to give you a quick update on what's going on in the casino world. As you probably all have heard, um, the governor has instituted new uh, rules for uh, the casinos. So um, they are now uh, operating at a reduced number of hours. Um, and so we've got, so MGM is now operating from 10 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. with some you know, reduced hours for restaurants and other things. And in fact, I think the tap bar, has, the tap sports bar is uh, closed, um, not for good, but for the, for the duration of this, um, this reduction in hours. Uh, Plain Ridge Park Casino is running from seven in the morning till 9.30 p.m. and Encore is running from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. And I do see that we have um, Jose Delgado here from MGM. Did you want to add anything in, Jose, on what's happening with um, with MGM? Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Joe, and thank you to the committee. Uh, not much more other than what, what Joe said. Obviously, we're, we're dealing, like everybody else, with the effects of the pandemic and, and spike. Uh, that's happening not just in Massachusetts across the country. So as Joe mentioned, you know, we have, uh, as a result, we've had to cut our hours into that time base. And so um, that obviously has changed our business model. And, and obviously, probably folks have read that that's also had an impact on, on our employees. And so, um, you know, we're going to continue to work with, with, you know, obviously the Gaming Commission and, and the state um, and hope that, you know, we can get this turned around so we can kind of get back to whatever the new normal is um but you know currently we're that's what we're dealing with like everyone else so, so thank okay you. thanks jose um okay so getting into the um guidelines um i'm going to share just an email that i got um so we opened up the um We opened up the guidelines for public comment and the public comment closed on November 9th. And we did receive one uh, set of written comments where I thought I'd just go through that here. Um, these came in from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council and primarily uh, dealt with the um, workforce development uh, grants that we give out. And uh, some of the, the, the points here, um, so under item one here, it says the community mitigation fund language reflects the needs of small businesses and entrepreneurs in addition to workforce development. Um, we propose a new grant category to support regional business development separately from workforce development if possible. Um, so under our community uh, grants that we do, uh, that type of work is eligible under those grants. And in fact, we've given out a number of grants to deal with uh, to communities to work with their local small businesses to try to develop relationships with the casinos or, or build capacity for some of those uh, groups to um, hopefully participate as suppliers and so on to the casino. So, so that's really already an eligible um, activity, although it's not you know, sort of specifically spelled out in there, uh, but that is something that uh, many of the groups have uh, availed themselves, or many of the communities have uh, used that uh, to, to help uh, create those connections. Um, and this second one, this is interesting. Um, I think, uh, Peter, when we had our little introductory call, you actually brought this item up yourself saying that, that the high unemployment from all hospitality and retail industries now includes a group of the casino itself. Saying so the unemployed hospitality and retail workers need upskilling to break into new careers 
or to be able to move up the career ladder in the casino now or when reemployed. Um, these unemployed workers are not able to buy services or goods from the casino or, or the area small businesses. So um, in, in this case, you know, that actually makes kind of a compelling argument that if, if a workforce group wanted to try to identify actually laid off casino workers to help them retrain or, uh, um, you know, to, to do something temporarily that that, um, it's probably an eligible use, uh, probably, it is an eligible use under our current guidelines. Of course, whoever the applicant was would need to make a um, sort of a concerted effort to to make that connection to the casino and 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 make that argument, um, but we would certainly listen to an argument of that nature. Um, we decided not to change the guidelines, uh, really, sort of to include that. Although we did add in uh, just a brief the segment that talked about unemployed uh, casino workers in the guidelines, um, but essentially that would be eligible as long as that nexus to the casino can be made. Um, and item number three talks about including ESOL training and adult basic education programs as part of the workforce development grants. Um, that is already something that pretty much every grant that we have given has had an adult basic education uh, component to it. Um, so we feel that we really already have that, that well covered in our current um, guidelines and grants. And item four here talks about digital digital literacy training. Um, so that's something that most of our grants have had a component of that in it. And again, while we didn't spell it out specifically in the guidelines, um, I think actually when we, I think the program that we did at uh, Springfield Technical Community College a couple of years ago, part of that included um, getting folks um, Chromebooks and uh, for the classes and uh, teaching them some digital literacy and working on uh, developing resumes and things of that nature. So already something we include. We did add a couple of words just indicating digital literacy is certainly eligible uh, in the guidelines. And then item number five talks about wraparound supports for families, particularly on food and housing insecurity. Um, when we discussed this item, it, we really felt this this kind of went a little bit beyond what our scope of work is uh, as issuing grants. You know, the, we we can issue grants to government entities. We can't really give grants to um, families and individuals um, on things like that. We can only give grants to the government entities. So it was sort of our feeling that this was a little bit beyond the scope of what we're able to do. Not that it wouldn't be great to do that. Um, so essentially the, the guidelines um, that were given out to you folks uh, at the last meeting um, haven't really changed. Obviously we cleaned up a little bit of stuff here and there but and added a few words here and there, but essentially what, what you see is, is what, is what we're, we're going out with. Um, and those go in front of the commission on Thursday to be voted and Assuming a positive vote of the commission, we will then start our solicitation for projects for the next round. So that will start. So we'll, we'll be posting this on Monday. So it's actually a couple of weeks earlier than we um, than we usually uh, have gotten this done. Usually we were in early December when we started our solicitation. So being able to go out before the end of November. Um, is good. We'll be able to, uh, you know, folks will have a couple more weeks to work on their grant applications. So um, that's really finishes the discussion on the guidelines. Did anybody have any any particular uh, questions? Yes. Um, yes, Bellamy. I know it's too late to change the guidelines for this year because they're in draft. But I think that that email makes a compelling case that the guidelines really should be slightly modified to clarify some of these points that are understood but not explicit. It doesn't take a lot of words to do that, but in a couple of places you could say business development or workforce development, or you could add ESOL. Just a few extra words um, uh, would help to clarify what's available and, and forestall questions like the one that was presented to you. 
Right. Yeah, we did make a couple. Yeah, we, no, we did make a couple of minor tweaks in in the guidelines. We did add the digital literacy section in. Oh, good. And we did, yeah, we did make a couple of very minor tweaks. Um, but you know, it's not. We obviously we didn't add a whole new category. You know, the first right. question was right. talking about adding a whole new category of grants. Uh, while that's covered under another category, um, you know, we probably should clarify that um, okay. a little bit more. Thanks. Okay, anyone else? Any other questions? Okay, well, uh, none appearing. So, uh, Sam, I'll turn it back to you. Yep, so um, from then on, we're going to move on to talking about the MGC research agenda and responsible gaming. Okay, we have Mark Vanderlinden here, and, uh, and is Teresa going to be here as well, Mark? Um, actually, we're we're splitting uh, meetings today, so I'll I'll take on the the whole uh, discussion about the research agenda and um, the games this program. Great. So, um, first, hi everybody. Um, it's it's nice to see all of you. Um, my name is Mark Vanderlinden, I'm the director of research and responsible gaming uh, with the Gaming Commission, um, which oversees exactly what we're talking about here today, which is um, the MGC research. Um, agenda, as well as some of the responsible gaming initiatives that we have um, at each of the three casinos in Massachusetts, including MGM Springfield. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to try to do that. I was having some trouble with that yesterday. Okay, can you see, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> Um, all right. You can still see it? All right. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. All right. So, um, Massachusetts is in a unique position. Um, you know, there's a lot of states. I think how many states have uh, state regulated casino gambling? It's, I think it's somewhere in the, it's, it's over 40 or right around 40 states. Not a single one of them has has a research mandate, um, at least not to the extent that of what Massachusetts does. And I think, you know, it was the legislature and when they passed the act, expanded gaming act in 2011, that recognized sort of the expansiveness of the casino industry across um, the United States, but the complete lack of of research. Um, that really talks about what are the impacts, both good and bad, of casino gambling. Um, and especially sort of that, that um, really valuable, neutral um, research that really gets at, at the heart of the issue. And so they built into the Expanded Gaming Act, Section 71, which really um, lays out for the Gaming Commission exactly what we need to uh, measure. And it covers it in, in kind of some big bucket areas here. So in order to, uh, to understand the social and economic effects of expanded gaming and use the findings to inform evidence-based policy and regulation, um, it includes this very large bucket looking at the neuroscience, psychology, sociology, epidemiology, etiology of gambling. Um, it also included such areas as looking at public safety impacts, um, um, and I think that's uh, about it. Um, so the, the idea, and I wanna go back to this idea that using the findings to inform evidence-based policy and regulation, which I think you know, that is what you are charged with doing um, through the work that you're doing on, the, on this committee is, is hopefully looking at, at impacts, looking at the evidence and what those impacts are and, and making decisions about how to, how to respond. Um, to the extent that, that we can, you can use the, the findings from the research agenda, the, to the extent that you can use me to help you with that, I'm more than, than happy to, to do that. Um, a, a lot of times it's just I can direct you to the right study and the right chapter of, of the right study. Um, we also have a responsible gaming framework, and this is another body uh, sort of a document that the Gaming Commission d 
developed that really helps guide both the research agenda as well as our overall strategy as it relates to responsible gaming. Um, this too also really highlights the idea that um, we want to use research to inform best practice uh, models for responsible gaming strategies. Um, and you'll see that part of the research agenda, while it also covers the areas above, it also really it, it um, does a really good job of evaluating the responsible gaming programs that we have. And again, it, then this last piece of it is creating and translate knowledge to support evidence-informed decision-making. Um, that is a, a key point here that you'll see, you'll see it in, in many different ways through the Gaming Commission, but certainly through the Section 71, the framework, um, we have another document that really highlights the need of this, which is a strategic plan for the, the research agenda. Um, when I said that it was really important that we move towards a, a uh, have a neutral body that carries out this research. So um, back in 2013, the MGC initiated a contract with UMass Amherst School of Health and Health Sciences. They submitted a proposal to the commission. It was a competitive procurement there were a few other um, proposals as well, but their proposal included um, a partnership with the UMass Donahue Institute um, and several independent researchers that, that focus on the area of gambling studies around the country and even into Canada um, in order to form the social and economic impacts of gambling in Massachusetts. What this group does is they take that large, that large overarching approach of looking at, at the overall um, social and economic impacts of, of gaming in Massachusetts. And you know, they're it's they're methodological principles. I'm probably oversimplifying it in this slide, but it's it's relatively simple. Identify how much money is involved, where it's coming from, and where it's going assess the impact for years before and years after the introduction of gambling venues and compre comprehensively assess the potential economic and social impacts and utilize multiple sources for triangulation. Um, a couple pieces here that, that's of note is that, you know, casinos are still a relatively new industry in Massachusetts, but the, this um, project started in 2013. So between 2013, um, and really for about the first three or four years, it was all about building a baseline so that we could then compare, you know, what was Springfield like before the introduction of casinos, during the construction phase of casinos, and what are the impacts um, afterwards compared to those two timeframes beforehand. Um, um, so, yeah, so that, that uh, ends up being an important piece of this. Um, the other piece of it is the, the idea of triangulation. There, there's many different data sources that are, the research team draws upon, and to the extent uh, possible, they want to try to understand what causation is. And so if you see real estate impacts, um, if you look at real estate uh, prices, commercial real estate prices in, in Springfield before the casino and after the casino, how do you know that the it was really caused um, to go up or to go down? by the introduction of, of MGM Casino uh, Springfield. And so th to the extent possible, they'll use multiple sources of data in order to, to triangulate that so that there's a stronger sense of, of what is causation and, and what may just happen to be coincidence. So um, when I talked about building a baseline over the course of three or four years, they built a baseline uh, looking at Massachusetts as a state at whole, but then they also did a targeted approach to this, looking at the specific host and surrounding community where uh, casinos were, were set to be located. Um, the baseline indicators covered, as I said before, both health as well as economic and fiscal five dimension, 14 total indicators for social, six dimensions and 15 indicators. And just to dive down a little bit further in that, here are the uh, five um, dimensions that, that are being examined through the social and health research. I won't go and list each of the um, uh, indicators here, but you can see that um, it's organized in a way that really tries to comprehensively 
understand some of the social and health impacts. So for example, um, suicide is a great example that one uh, research would indicate that problem gambling is closely associated um, with suicides. And so would you, while we, we look at the prevalence and incidence of problem gambling in the state, um, you also want to pay attention to what the other impacts are that, that span from that. So you'd want to understand whether or not you would see suicides in, increase in, in the state. Um, we also take a look at the social and economic um, or fiscal, um, and here are the dimensions and indicators that, that we're taking, taking a look at there. And so uh, just again, using just one example um, without diving into too much detail, you want to understand um, both business starts and as well as businesses that um, are struggling perhaps as a result of the introduction of the, of the casino in downtown Springfield. Um, so you want to take a look at, at that, but you also then want to understand um, perhaps bankruptcy um, and how that's impacted whether that goes up or goes down as a result. You wanna understand rents, and perhaps that begins then to inform um, uh, whether rents go, go up or rents go down. Um, one would assume that rents would go up in close proximity to a casino as it begins to, as, as that rises, so do, so do many other sectors. But um, you don't wanna just assume these things. You wanna you want to really understand it. You want, um, you want research to back up what some of these assumptions are um, so you as a community mitigation committee can begin making some of the decisions about that. Um, so here are, I'm, I, again I'm not going to go into any great detail, but this I thought was um, a, a great example of how this is accumulation of a lot of research and I don't know if any of you made it to the Sigma Research Day on uh, last month, but um, it covered a lot of ground, um, it, it, not all of it, but it covered several key areas, including taking uh, a look, um, a deep look at the impact of um, MGM Springfield in the first year to, to 18 months of operation. Um, it also included a look at um, uh, the, the social side of this. So. Um, the UMass team fielded a large um, targeted population survey to Springfield and the surrounding areas, looking at, at such things as problem gambling prevalence, gambling attitudes, um, gambling participation um, within the community. A, a great, uh, uh, one of the central concerns when MGM Springfield opened, or for that matter, any of the casinos opened in Massachusetts was um, will you see an increase in the prevalence rate of, of problem gambling? One would assume that you would, both just common sense would say that you open up a casino, more people are gambling, which increases the likelihood that, um, that you would see people developing gambling related problems. And in fact, this is supported by, by research in this area done in other jurisdictions um, around the country. Um, not to, to kind of get to the, the end of the story, but um, it was interesting that we did not, or our researchers did not find an increase in the prevalence rate of problem gambling in Springfield and the surrounding areas um, when they did this targeted follow-up population survey one year after MGM um, Springfield opened. Um, they do make some assumptions or they, they do make some uh, conclusions about why that, that possibly is. Um, and without going into great detail, I'll, the, the report um, and the slides are posted um, through these links below. Um, and that wasn't the extent of the research that's been done in Springfield. There's also been a look at a, a baseline as well as a follow-up look at real estate impacts. Um, we've done a baseline um, one year and we're working on two year the, the two-year follow-up in terms of looking at how has um, MGM Springfield affected um, crimes, calls for service, and collisions in and around the Springfield area. That's, that's an incredible um, study that does not draw upon our team at UMass, but draws upon a crime analyst um, that we've been working with for a number of years, as well as the cooperation of um, each of the local police departments um, in Springfield and all of the surrounding communities. 
Um, there was a, a host community profile building, again, that important baseline. Um, and then interesting, but you might not assume that we, we pay close attention to how does MGM Springfield affect the, uh, the state's lottery. Um, built into the Expanded Gaming Act was also a mandate that, the, that we try to protect the uh, lottery to the extent possible. Um, and that's largely because uh, the lottery is a major source of local aid to um, towns and cities throughout the Commonwealth. Um, and, uh, and, and that's an important source of revenue for them. Um, if you want to do a deeper dive on any of the, the research, um, here is a link to the uh, research webpage. Uh, basically, it's at massgaming.com. If you go under about, there's a research agenda page. We just actually recently redid uh, this page that I'm hopeful that um, folks will find it much easier to navigate around and get to the, the specific area of interest that, that, they, that they have. But again, uh, please use me as a resource that if you have any questions whatsoever, are looking for a specific study, have a specific area of interest, um, let me direct you to it. Um, or if you have a question that falls outside of, of kind of our, of our research agenda, um, I'm pretty familiar with the extent of the gaming research that's been done in the US, or at least I can, I can try to find um, you a, a resource that you can draw upon. Um, another interesting initiative that we launched just um, over the past summer is MODE, or the Massachusetts Open Data Exchange. We, um, over the past seven plus years, have accumulated a mountain of data. It's really good quality data that helps us paint the picture of impacts of, of gambling in Massachusetts. We've paid our research teams um, to analyze that data and report on that on that data. And those also are really helpful to better understand or bring clarity to this. But it's not the only, only way and only analyses that can be done. Um, so our, our goal and mode is to make sure that data is available for other researchers, that they can also use that for their own research purposes. Um, but then it is also turned around and um, the Commonwealth can benefit from those additional analyses as well. So um, it's an exciting project that we hope to see some, some benefits from soon from the researchers that have requested specific data sets. Again, this, this is also available on the research page uh, um, of the MGC website. Um, next, I wanted to talk a little bit of, about um, about game sense, and in order to do that, I need to um, close out my slideshow and and switch over to a uh, a different so different screen. Hold on, just one second. Bear with me. Oh. All right. Can you can you see the game sense? Uh, Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Let me go back to the beginning. So we um, recently released the, the GameSense um, impact report. GameSense is a program that um, basically the, the Gaming Commission recognizes that, you know, we introduced casinos um, in 2011. The first casino opened up in 2000 and I think, is it 14, 15? Um, in order as, as an economic stimulus uh, to bring jobs to bring to bring revenue to the commonwealth and into towns um, but we don't do that at at any cost um, that um, we need to pay attention to um, to the harm that gambling can potentially uh, bring as well um, i've always said that you you can't realize the the full economic benefits of expanded gaming springfield can never truly truly realize the, the, the great potential of casinos opening up when you have persons within within the, the city or the surrounding area that are being harmed by it because those 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 harms begin to erode any of the economic um, or potential of, of expanded gaming in Massachusetts. And the, the Gaming Commission um, and I believe the legislature also really really supported and endorsed this concept as well. 
Um, and so they they um, re made a requirement uh, throughout actually the Expanded Gaming Act that really pays attention to mitigating potential harm. Um, included in that was a requirement that there was on-site space um, set aside separate from, from the casino, the casino had to provide it, for a responsible gaming program to be identified um, and fulfilled by the Gaming Commission. We adopted um, and developed this program called GameSense. Um, what is GameSense? GameSense to me um, is really a prevention program. We want to recognize there will be people that are harmed by gambling, but to the extent that we can prevent that harm from the first place, everybody knows that you know the term ounce of prevention or the the true benefit, the amount that you can save down the road if you put prevention up front. So GameSense is an innovative, responsible gaming program that encourages players to adopt and maintain positive behaviors and attitudes that reduce, reduce gambling-related harm. Now, I don't know how many of you, um, if you've all been to MGM Springfield, but um, one of the first things that you see when you enter the gaming floor out of the elevators is the GameSense Information Center. That information center is staffed, um, well, when the casino is 24-7, it's staffed 16 hours a day, seven days a week by trained GameSense advisors. Um, and it's not just a matter of sharing brochures. It's not just giving them information. It's really engaging with patrons to challenge some of their beliefs about, about gambling, um, provide them with information and tools that, that hopefully let, when they do enter the casino floor, when they sit down at a slot machine or a table game, their eyes are wide open. They know exactly what they're getting into and what, what, how to keep it fun, how to keep it as a form of entertainment as opposed to, um, going down a path where it's creating harm. We have a number of different tools that um, help us accomplish, um, accomplish that. Um, our GameSense advisors are certainly the, very, the front line um, and there to, to greet the patrons. Our GameSense uh, team also does extensive uh, casino employee training. So recognizing that it's not just something that needs to sit at the GameSense Information Center. It's, a, it's working to create a culture within um, MGM Springfield that supports and promotes uh, responsible gaming. So they do extensive training with all employees at, at the casino. Um, and they do an even more extensive training for select staff and executive staff at the casino. Um, coming to a casino near you, or, um, already at Plain Ridge Park Casino, um, and soon to MGM Springfield is a, a program called Play My Way. It's a slot-based program um, that allows players to set a budget um, from the slot machine, um, and it provides reminders for them um, as they approach the budget that they agree to. It's a pre-commitment strategy. You say you wanna spend $100 when you sit down at the slot machine, it supports your decision to do that as you, as you get closer to that budget. It provides reminders for players who are enrolled at, at uh, 50%, 75%, 100%. And if you do go over um, your budget, it doesn't cut you off. It'll continue to provide you um, with reminder notifications uh, pushed out to, to the machine that you're sitting at. Um, and when I said that there are persons that will experience gambling-related harm, that is, that is true. And we need to do what we can uh, to create a safety net. Um, we, we have a relationship with uh, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and some of the local health departments um, to assure that a safety net is there. Um, within our span of control at the casinos, we have the Voluntary Self-Exclusion Program. We're basically somebody who says, I have a problem. I'm not able to control my gambling. I need help. Uh, the Voluntary Self-Exclusion Program can, can move in and help provide that type of external control, basically saying we'll prohibit you from um, uh, entering the, the gaming floor at the casinos. Um, if by chance you do enter the gaming floor, you're, you're cut off from um, the potential of winning any type of jackpot. So it takes away that winning incentive, which is, is primary. It also cuts them off from you know, rewards points or enrolling into the player card. Um, no promotions or marketing material is, is sent to them. Um, also a program, both GameSense, Play My Way, and the Voluntary Self-Exclusion Program, as I said before, we evaluate these extensively um, and, uh, and have had some actually really pretty promising results up front. 
we'll continue to evaluate them, recognizing that this is an ever-changing terrain and our, our strategies and tactics will need to, to change along with that. Um, anyway, I'm, I just gave you like a, a really fast sort of uh, overview of what we're doing in the area of research, what we're doing in the area of responsible gaming. More than happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Hey, Mark, it's Joe. Um, on the on the research agenda piece, um, I know you've done some studies already in Springfield, and and not to put you too much on the spot, but are there any uh, sort of key things that you've seen? A few things maybe that are surprising, or or um, you know, uh, sort of important findings that that have happened so far. You know, it's, um, yeah. I mean, it, to some degree, it's the, the lack of findings that have most surprised me, Joe, um, that MGM came out with a, a big plan to open up a casino in, in Springfield, um, an outward facing casino. And it's not that there haven't been challenges, but if you take a look at the public safety impacts, um, we've chased down a lot of different angles on this to try to identify what, uh, whether there are types of crimes um, that would be associated with the introduction of, of with the opening of NGM Springfield. Um, and there's been very, very little um, in terms of, of public safety impacts that we've been able to see. Um, and this is, you know, this is, it's, we're looking at both the data, but we're also, it, the, our public safety study draws upon, you know, the testimonial of, of um, crime analysts from each of the police departments in Springfield and the surrounding areas where they're available, or, or sergeants or police chiefs, um, and uh, and so it's been really really striking to me that that hasn't necessarily been been the case. Um, and same with the prevalence rate of of problem gambling. Um, there are groups that are are at greater risk of developing a gambling of developing a gambling problem, but in terms of the general population within Springfield and the surrounding area, some of those those impacts have not we haven't we haven't uh, been able to to see where there's a spike in any of these specific areas. It doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't mean that we need to stop looking at this. Um, you know, one year out from opening you typically begin to see some, some changes and some shifting in the, in the landscape, but, it, but it's not necessarily the case. Maybe it takes longer. Um, maybe some of the impacts, both good and bad, really take a while for us to, to begin to see. Um, perhaps the, the way in which we're measuring it, it isn't, it isn't uh, quite getting at that sort of the ground level. So for example, we have a, a study in Springfield um, looking at um, uh, gambling behavior and problem gambling among the um, Latinx uh, uh, population in, in Springfield. And I think that that will be really telling to, to get a better understanding if we're looking at the general population of Springfield, um, we're not necessarily seeing um, a significant impact in terms of gambling related harm, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's not happening within specific within specific populations or communities. And so we we want to take a, a closer look at some of that. Great, thanks. Um, and just, you know, there's been some interesting, some really positive and heartening economic impacts. I think that, you know, MGM came in and with with really high hopes, um, and there there has been a fair amount of of economic benefit to um, to the city. So, uh, just a question: uh, When you say a fair amount of economic impact, are you able to quantify that? Do you know um, what amount of dollars or whatever metric is being used to kind of um, say that? Yeah. So. Um, without going into great detail, because it would require me to re kind of remember everything in the report, I, I would 
uh, encourage you to take a look at the um, operational, first year operational report um, of MGM. Um, and it, it goes into much greater detail of the direct and indirect economic um, impact of, of the casino and in the community. So um, a few slides back, there was a, a link to, um, to the slide deck as well as the, the actual presentation. Um, so you might want to take a look. Take yeah, a look. no, thank you. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and Samuel, if you have any questions after you do take a look at that, um, hopefully I can answer them or I can certainly connect you with our research team. Um, they're overly enthusiastic about a lot of this. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions for Mark or? Yeah, I, I'd like to just uh, hop in. Um, before I became a member of this committee, um, in my, when I was wearing the hat at uh, Wayfinders, I was part of a group that came together to discuss uh, changes in the residential real estate market that we were perceiving uh, in the region. And, uh, looking for you know what made what what caused that uh, what's the likelihood for the future and really mm -hmm. for those people who might develop housing and there's a sense that we have not an adequate supply of housing which tends to drive up prices um, uh, you know you need to know where the housing is going to want to be who your customer is going to be and so forth and uh, uh, so there is a regional study underway that's Hampton, Hampshire, and Franklin counties. But of course, that encompasses Springfield and the surrounding towns that are part of your direct purview uh, in terms of uh, MGM. And uh, oh. uh, coincidentally, we engaged Donahue Institute to do the research. Uh, I think I heard of this, actually, Peter. You yeah. may have, because I talked to Bruce Stebbins about it when we were just starting, because mm -hmm. he was interested in those questions as well. Right. And, um, uh, so at any rate, that, there's certainly ample uh, opportunity and desire to share whatever we mutually learn, because you're focused, uh, and we're looking at a little bit broader picture, uh, because certainly people can commute from any place in those three counties mm -hmm. fairly easily. And we're curious now um, with COVID, you know, all of a sudden upon us, uh, it's changed. And now, okay, what's the dynamic with a couple thousand people losing their jobs? Right. And, and yeah. uh, uh, that's, that's, you know, that's the other side. You never quite got to 3,000. So, it wasn't that many lost jobs, but when you when you count the other fallout, the other businesses that lost business, uh, it, it could get to be a considerable number, and it could reverse the market trend that we were watching. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the low interest rates, people are still buying houses. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard yet of rents going down, um, but sooner or later, something will happen. And uh, how that fits, how one affects the other, I'm not sure. I think it was a it was a healthy fix before, although it was creating some dislocations of people who can't pay a raised you know rent. Um, when you're in a weak market, the rent isn't high enough, or the sale price isn't high enough on a house. Uh, to want to build another one, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. so there's a real lack of, of new units coming on, taking advantage of an opportunity. And uh, uh, anyways, we're, the, the group is continuing to look into that. There's wide support. Um, uh, there, you know, it's quite a broad group of people on the advisory committee that was put together for it. And we certainly would like you to take a look at it when we, uh, when we get it done. See what yeah, I would love to take a look at that. And I think that, you know, that's some of the triangulation that perhaps you could, we could use in order to begin to look at what true true impacts are of, of the casino. Um, so that, that, that would be great. 
Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Um, if I can just say, you know, of Zazon the line, but you know, the cooperation of, of MGM in order to provide the, the data for the research, but um, as well as you know, their cooperation and um, and in, in a lot of cases leadership and uh, kind of rolling out some of the responsible gaming um, initiatives and creating that culture is really really important. So. Uh, uh, Shout out to MGM and, and Jose. Thanks, Mark. Mark. Appreciate that, Mark. I actually wanted to, if, if I can add one thing, and, and, and I heard this, and I, I know I read it on the, um, the uh, Mass Live a lot of times. Um, there's this one piece where it says that MGM never hit 3,000 jobs. I just want to clarify that for folks. Uh, while it's not important right now in the grand scheme of things, but the property did open with just over uh, 3,000 jobs. And, and through that time, the research that the um, that Mark's team and the UMass uh, Sigma study folks actually pointed out was to start off at 3,000, obviously that tapered um, over time. But I just wanted to make sure I corrected that. Um, and also uh, some of the impacts um, that you guys will read that the study put out is essentially you know, $900 million uh, worth of economic development in, in the area. I think that equated not only to the jobs that the property had um, directly, but also indirectly, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, it was somewhere five to 6,000 jobs uh, across the state that the, that the opening of the property impacted in, in the state of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the big pieces for the study was to capture um, the recapturing of dollars that was going over the border to the state of Connecticut and other states that have gaming. And what the, the research found was that 40% uh, of the dollars that were coming in were actually recaptured dollars, either Massachusetts residents that were going out of state or out of state folks coming in. And so those are key uh, findings that I thought was, was pretty important in terms of uh, the economic uh, piece of, of the study. So. Yeah, I think about, you know, it, it um, doesn't just take a look at the, sh it does take a look at the sheer number of jobs, but uh, the, the direct employment, but it also takes a look at kind of the ripple effect of, of those jobs, as well as the ripple effect of the, you know, what's it, nine? $900 million investment um, and what is the ripple effect of that and how many people does that ultimately end up affecting. So they use some really interesting economic modeling that gives us a picture that you wouldn't necessarily get by looking at a couple of the top line numbers um, uh, from uh, that are put out there. So. Please let me know if you have any, any questions. Um, as you dive into the research or as you're you're thinking about your own work, we're happy to to be a, a resource. Thank you. Um, I guess from there, uh, is there anything else that needs to be discussed before we move on to our next steps? Joe? Okay, so um, so today's meeting essentially concludes um, this committee's activities for this fall. So the, the, the next steps are the guidelines will be voted by the commissioners on uh, Thursday. Monday, we start our solicitation. Um, we are doing, I think we may have mentioned this at, at some of the earlier meetings, um, we're gonna do a series of workshops for folks. Um, so what we're gonna do is when the guidelines go final, we're gonna send a letter out to all of those communities that still have some reserve funds left and let them know that, you know, that that, that was the new guideline that they're gonna have until the end of 2021 to get that money um, programmed. And then what we're gonna do, we haven't set the date quite yet, but around the middle of December, probably December 15th or thereabouts, we're gonna have a meeting with all of those communities. And we'll, of course, we'll meet with them individually if they want to do that as well. But um, 
to try to give them some good ideas what other communities have used the money for, um, what are some of the things that are eligible. You know, we'd really love the communities to spend this money. Um, you know, we had the example of last year, Foxborough, uh, Rentham, and uh, Plain, Plainville all got together and said, hey, let, you know, Rentham says, we got these great, you know, shopping outlets, and Foxborough says, hey, we got Patriot Place and, and Gillette Stadium, and Plainville says, we've got the casino here. Why don't we work together and try to come up with a little, um, you know, uh, tourism plan to try to take advantage of all, all of our joint assets that we have around here. Um, and that worked out really great. So we want to highlight to the communities, maybe some things like that. Um, I think especially we, we have more communities out in region B that have not used their money. And some of these are those smaller communities um, who may not really, you know, have an idea of what to do with it, but maybe if several communities could pool their money, they could do a much larger study, a much more effective study, something of that nature. So that's step one. And then we're gonna do two workshops, uh, probably the first uh, full week in January. Uh, we're gonna do one for the workforce development uh, folks. We're gonna get everybody who's applied to us in the past and some other, other people together to talk about, um, you know, trying to think outside the box a little bit and see if, seeing if there are some other opportunities in workforce. That, um, that we can do. And, you know, we're gonna certainly invite the casinos to that. We'd love to have the HR folks and, and so on. And, you know, Mary Kate from over at MGM and, and some of the folks from Encore and Plainridge Ridge to say, hey, what are the needs in these, in the facilities? Um, so we think that'll be, that'll be great. And then another, a third workshop is gonna be for sort of the, the general grants that we get every year, the specific impact grants and the transportation planning and construction grants, things of that nature. Those are all, you know, relatively similar in nature. And, and the idea there is, again, to get people to be thinking about this stuff. And also, you know, it is our hope that doing these workshops and giving some sort of best practices, things of that nature will hopefully result in maybe some more better and complete applications. I'll just leave it at that. Um, we have had some difficulty with, uh, you know, getting good applications in. Um, you know, so, you know, we want we want to we want to grant this money to the communities, but we need to find real impacts, and we need to, um, you know, have good applications that support those. So, this outreach we're hopeful will do that. And so then, again, then the uh, application deadline is January thirty first. Um, which actually is a Sunday, but that's okay because everything is done online. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, it's not like we need to get paper, uh, paper uh, applications into us. So there's that. And, you know, yesterday we had our Region A meeting and, um, you know, it's been our intention over the past few years to try to make these uh, local community mitigation advisory committees a little more, um, more regular rather than just sort of this, you know, little sprint that we do in the fall. And uh, Region A suggested that we set up a meeting in say April. And I think that sounds like a good idea. Um, so we can set up a meeting uh, for, for both of the regions uh, sometime in April. We'll take a look at a bunch of dates and see where we are. And, you know, the thought there is, I think we're gonna have um, a public safety um, report for, Encore, but I think that still might be of interest um, to, to Region B as well. We will have gotten our applications in. We'll be in the middle of reviewing those applications so we can give you an update on uh, what we have coming in. And we may try to, um, you know, get some of our folks to, to give you an idea like we did today on the research agenda. You know, we also do um, horse racing and maybe that might be something that is, that's of interest to the group. Um, just to understand what we do in that in that realm, um, just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what some of the things are that we're working on in the commission, other than just community mitigation. So those are our next steps over the next uh, couple of months. Um, and I think uh, with that, Sam, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, uh, before we move on, does anyone have any questions for Joe on anything he just said? 
Sam, I had a question. Uh, what about the um, the lottery and the uh, on on track betting or the, uh, the sports uh, betting? I don't forget the sports betting. Yeah, if you could add that as an update in April, that might be good too. Yeah, I mean, there's now there's been um, there's been some pressure, I guess, that's been exerted by um, the groups to try to move that forward. You know, with the legislature and um, you know, we had a bill that was out there um, that would have uh, made the Gaming Commission the regulator for sports betting. Um, that didn't go anywhere in, in this past legislative session. Um, and I think the push is on to try to do something again. And Jose, maybe you have, do you have any, um, any flavor on what's happening with sports betting from, from your side? Yeah, there's, I mean, obviously there's been a lot, a lot of discussion over the past year to two years. Uh, most recently, uh, the House had included some language in their economic development bill. Um, and the Senate was uh, more leaning towards the budget, uh, which they just put out a budget uh, proposals, both the House and the Senate. The Senate included sports, what they didn't initially include sports spending in the budget, but um, there were some amendments added. So the hope is that either through the budget or through the economic development committee that there are some of the conference committees kind of go over it. I know that both the house and the governor have essentially, you know, it as, as part of, you know, what they see for next year, but still, still to be seen, um, you know, whether or not that gets done this year or, or next. Um, so there are a number of, essentially there's a number of, of um, pieces on the table at the moment. So, Looking forward to see what comes of that. Obviously, for, for our industry, we'd like to see it because it could definitely help in, in current times for, for us. But thanks, Jose. Yeah. So there, there's you know, as of the the last uh, bills that were in, like I said the Gaming Commission would be the uh, the authority that would that would manage uh, sports betting. And honestly, the the commission itself is sort of agnostic on that. If it's given to us, we will regulate it. If not, you know, we won't. Um, <laughs> so uh, anyway, but we are, we are certainly prepared to do that. Um, you know, there was back last summer, there was a lot of talk that something was going to happen or last spring, something was going to happen very quickly and that sort of withered on the vine. But uh, certainly, yeah, we'll be happy to give you an update, um, you know, in April. That's a great idea. Yeah, thank you. And with that, do we have any other matters to discuss? It doesn't appear so. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Great. So with that, I believe we are all done today. Tanya's just going to take um, the vote with that. Okay. Peter Gagliardi? Yes. Jennifer Bonfiglio? Yes. Michael Peace? Yes. Mary McNally? Carmina Fernandez? Judith Theocles? Samuel Darkwa? Yes. Lori Tanner? Yes. Allison Ebner? Richard Sullivan? Ellen Potashnik? Yes. All right, so one, two, three, four, five, six in favor of adjourning. Thank you, Tanya. So Great having job. Great job sharing, Sam. <laughs> Great job. An Very excellent good. first effort. Yeah. Very Thank good. you. Um, much appreciated. So having no further topics of discussion, uh, we're going to adjourn today's meeting. Um, thank you, everyone, and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. We'll be in touch. So long now. Bye-bye.